All right, to finish up our discussion of chemistry for biology, we need to finish with a very important atom, carbon. So we're gonna talk about why carbon is important to life and describe its role in uh, biology. And we'll talk a little bit about these things called functional groups, although you get more of that in chemistry and organic chemistry. Um, we're just gonna talk briefly about it, but we're gonna talk about the properties of carbon that make it so interesting for biology. All right, so carbon has many forms that we might find it in. You might like some of these more than others. Uh, we have something like coal, which is carbon. We have carbon fibers, which I find really interesting, right? Like you can add resin to them and form them into these very strong, uh, rigid shapes. You might be interested in diamonds. Those are crystallized carbon uh, from heat and pressure, um, but, we're gonna talk about carbon in the context of biology. And when we talk about biology, we are talking about organic molecules. Okay, right, so if you put in organic into Google image search, here's what you get. The term organic has been uh, changed, I guess, or uh, co-op now means healthy and great and stuff like that, right? Wrong, not in chemistry, okay? Organic in chemistry, means something completely different. It does not have to do with how your food is grown um, and that it only has nitrogen-based fertilizers from uh, plant material or animal material, things like that. Uh, the definition of organic farming, a little tricky, um, and whether it actually means much is debatable, um, but uh, that is beside the point. Let's talk about the chemical definition of organic. Um, so like when you go take organic chemistry, uh, we'll know what we're talking about. So let's talk about what some organic compounds actually are. Well, here's some organic compounds. Paper, which is made up of this thing called cellulose. Nail polish, that's an organic compound. It's got nitrocellulose, butyl acetate in there. Candles made with wax or tallow. Those are organic compounds. And a lot of organic compounds have the property that they will burn. Uh, fabrics, cellulose, something synthetic like nylon is an organic compound, rayon. Soaps, gasoline is an organic compound. And yes, we are indeed organic compounds as well. Uh, we are made up of a large portion of organic compounds in here. Many of them are hydrocarbons, um, just like gasoline, okay? We're gonna talk about why that's really important in a moment. So let's get the definition here. Organic molecules contain carbon atoms. Okay, that's, that's definition here. Um, that's what organic chemistry is all about. It's about carbon and how it can bond. And carbon can form so many different molecular shapes. Okay. We talked about chemistry. For our purposes, we want to think of chemistry as bonding, right? How do atoms bond together? Well, carbon, as we said, is super cool because it's got four valence electrons. That means that it can bond with four different things. That means it can make lots of different shapes. Shapes are what chemistry is all about. So, why is carbon so special? Why do we have a whole branch devoted to it? Because of those four bonds. Things like DNA, RNA, protein, carbohydrates, lipids, they're all organic molecules and that's what we're made up of. So we care a lot about that. So those four valence electrons mean you can get four other atoms on there. And that also means you can use carbon like it's the backbone of very, very long chains. Okay, hydrocarbons, I mentioned that term. What does that mean? Well, a hydrocarbon is carbon bonded to some hydrogen. Uh, a molecule that is a hydrocarbon is entirely hydrogen and carbon. Right, remember back to the first part of this chapter, I said each chemical bond, so here we have a carbon bonded to four hydrogens, each chemical bond is stored energy. What happens when you break bonds? you release that energy. So here we have CH4, our simplest hydrocarbon, methane. What happens when uh, methane uh, releases energy? It will burn, okay? Interesting, 
right? If you want to create power from methane or uh, cook something with it, that's super useful. How does that impact our bodies? We'll get there. Um, one second. Let's talk a little bit more about some cool things. Um, so oftentimes hydrocarbons and other organic compounds can form ring structures. Okay. It's not important to know the names of these things or anything like that. Um, and not all of these are technically hydrocarbons. Here you can see nitrogen is in there. Um, so, and down here we have things that aren't hydrocarbons either. But I mentioned these ring structures because there's several substances that we know of called alkaloids that they have very interesting properties and they all have these ring structures. For whatever reason, these ring structures tend to interact with our brain chemistry. So here is caffeine. You can see these two rings. Here's another interesting alkaloid, cocaine, that also interacts with our brain chemistry. Uh, nicotine, um, other things uh, that have these ring structures, alkaloids, they are um, interactive with our brain chemistry. Now, that's not what they actually evolve for. Things like nicotine uh, are plant compounds. They, tobacco makes high levels of nicotine. Uh, it's actually a substance that evolved to kill bugs that were trying to eat it. It just happens to interact with our brain chemistry differently. If you took enough of it, you would also die, but you're much bigger than a bug, so you'd have to ingest a lot of it. Um, so this is an interesting thing where... Uh, we often find uses for things uh, that aren't what they actually evolved for, and we steal them from nature. All right, so uh, we can have these ring structures. They're cool, they, they provide different properties. What I want you to take from this is, in chemistry, shape matters, okay? So this shape and this shape are similar, and they have kind of similar effects. One is stronger than the other, but uh, the, the ring structure gives them some of their properties. This is a really important point. We'll talk about shape a lot in this course, shape of molecules and how that impacts their function. All right, let's throw out another term here. This thing called isomers. Isomers are when we have the same chemical formula, but a different shape. Remember I said shape affects properties. Here is uh, an example of that. We have uh, butane, which is C4H10. It can be arranged in this linear molecule here, or it can be kind of this branch structure. And these are two different substances. One is butane, one is isobutane. Again, uh, butane gets used as a fuel, butane lighters and things like that. It stores a lot of energy. It's got lots of bonds. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 bonds there, right? That's a lot of stored energy in there. These different arrangements though have slightly different properties. I'm not gonna get into what they are here, um, but the chemistry class, they'll talk all about it. They have different properties though, because they're different shapes, but this structure or the formula but the formula is the same. They have the same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens, just arranged differently. So these are called structural isomers. We can also get what we call geometric isomers. All right, what does that mean? Well, here we have uh, this thing called butene, where we have two carbons double bonded together. That means they store or share two electrons bonded to CH3 and hydrogen on either side. Now you can see there's two different arrangements here. We can have the CH3s both on the bottom or one CH3 on the bottom and one CH3 on the top. These are called geometric isomers and we have different terms for this. I introduce these terms uh, so that you understand the basis here. This is called cis, that means they are on the same side and this is called trans, that means they are on the opposite side, okay? You can think of cis is the, what we call the boat and trans is the chair structure. That's sometimes how people remember them. Okay, so those are isomers, right? Uh, same components arranged differently. They'll actually interact differently um, and have different, slightly different properties. That is particularly important for biology when we talk about the last type of isomer here, which is called an enantiomer. 
All right, this one's a little bit difficult to conceptualize, but here we have a carbon and on it we have four different uh, atoms bonded. We have fluorine out here, uh, bromine here, chloride and hydrogen. Okay, the this is what we call the L configuration and here we have the D configuration. So here we have the bromine here and uh, we, uh, then can flip this around and we have the uh, different configuration here um, that gives us the uh, D isomer, okay? All right, why does this matter? Again, the chemistry side of it, we're saving for chemistry class, but in nature, there's usually one enantiomer of uh, the molecule and that is useful to an organism. The other enantiomer cannot be processed by that, the organism. So here's an example. This is alanine, which was one of our amino acids. Alanine in the L form can be utilized by the body. The D form of alanine, just because it's swapped like this, cannot be utilized by the body. That's really interesting. There are uh, different sugars that can have these properties. We have D-glucose, also called dextrose, that you can use. The L version of it, you cannot use, although it does taste sweet. So in theory, it could be an artificial sweetener. It's very hard to make though, so uh, we don't use it as that. But it's just showing you that uh, our body can utilize certain things versus others and uh, can be very, very specific, right? These look almost identical, but they have different properties. All right, finally, we have Samuel L. Jackson. You can see he's going to the left here and we have Samuel D. Jackson. He's going to the right here. He's an enantiomer as well. It's a chemistry joke. Uh, if you didn't laugh, I don't know what to say. You just don't have a good sense of humor. All right, so those are isomers same chemical formula, different structure. What do you take from this? That shape matters, right? Shape determines properties in chemistry, not just what's in it, but how it's shaped. All right, one last little piece here. Again, you'll get more of this in organic chemistry. And if you go on to 400 level biochemistry, they'll make you memorize these things. Do not memorize these. I just want to show you that there are kind of some common themes here. We call these functional groups. Uh, different functional groups give molecules shared properties. So if you tack a methyl group onto the end of a molecule, uh, it will have certain properties. It might be slightly nonpolar then. If you tack a hydroxyl, which is OH, onto the end of something, it might make it polar. Here are two things with hydroxyl groups in them. This is isopropyl alcohol. It's rubbing alcohol. It has the OH structured right here. This is ethyl alcohol. This is the alcohol that you can drink. It will not kill you, at least not as quickly as isopropyl alcohol will. It will get you drunk, um, but it is toxic. It will kill you if you ingest enough of it. It has a hydroxyl group, but it is structured differently. Both have hydroxyl groups, both are alcohols. They have similar properties. They're both alcohols um, and they have related properties to them because of this hydroxyl group. There's other functional groups like the amino group. Every amino acid has one of these on it. Phosphate groups are important. Sulfhydryl, um, carbonyl, um, carboxyl. Don't worry about memorizing this. Um, I just want you to think about these, that there are different little motifs or things that we can tack on to molecules that will give them similar properties here. We call those functional groups. All right, so that's a lot of stuff, right? Let's uh, tie it together to some like grounded stuff and we will come back to this in this course. I wanna introduce to you why we're pointing out all these things from chemistry. Well, here's a phosphate group on this DNA molecule. That will be really important when we talk about the structure of DNA. Uh, here we have the double helix. So here's uh, our 3D model, right? You can see it's kind of like a twisted ladder. We have these little rungs in the middle and these kind of rails on the side here. Uh, 
in the two-dimensional diagram, here's the rails and here's our little rungs in the middle, your DNA double helix is nucleotides bonded together. These bonds in the middle are hydrogen bonds. Now, remember, I talked in chapter one about that PCR reaction, how we could use heat to unzip the DNA to replicate it. These hydrogen bonds, although they're weak individually, they're pretty strong together. And when you have a long chain of DNA, say it's a million bases long, that's pretty strong. But the covalent bonds that are here on the side are even stronger. So we can use heat, 95 degrees Celsius, to break these hydrogen bonds, but keep these bonds intact. That allows us to replicate DNA in PCR. Okay, there's a lot of different types of bonds in here, um, but that difference is important. We'll come back to that in the DNA chapter. Let's talk about something else. Energy storage. You're probably aware that fats and oils store more energy per gram than carbohydrates and proteins, right? That is because of the number of bonds that are in there uh, and the amount of energy that they store. So here we have some examples of what we call fatty acids. These are lipids. Um, they have lots of carbons and hydrogens and lots of bonds in here. That's stored energy. Lots of bonds, lots of stored energy. That means fats and oils are great for energy storage. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between fats and oils in uh, our macromolecules chapter. Um, but these things are going to store energy well. That's why fats will burn. Wax, tallow, things like that. Um, they'll burn very, very well. So you actually have a lot of stored energy in you in here. Okay, we'll talk more about these. You've probably heard of saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. We'll talk about what that means in the macromolecules chapter. Just planting the seed that to describe these things, we have to understand some of the chemistry here. Okay, so let's wrap up. Organic molecules contain the element carbon. We gotta have at least one of those. But carbon is super cool because it can form up to four bonds. So you can get all kinds of different shapes and structures and long chains. Remember, shape dictates properties. Can easily covalently bond with the main components of life, as we said, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Okay, And we talked about hydrocarbons. They contain only carbon and hydrogen. Store lots of energy in all those bonds. Uh, Bonds are stored energy, so a high number of bonds in a long chain means a lot of stored energy. Gasoline is a hydrocarbon, it's a real long chain. Um, the shape of the molecule is just as important as what is in it, right? And we talked about uh, things that can have the same formula, but different shapes, we call those isomers. Finally, we talked about functional group. These are little additional bits that can give molecules similar properties. So. That is our uh, chemistry crash course here. Uh, if you need to, make sure you go back and review that. Go through the study guide with those things. If you have any questions about it, let me know and I can explain it a little bit better to you uh, or fill in any details you need. All right, that is the end of chapter two. Good job making it through there.